I think the Fed is not happy to see so much speculation in the financial markets. I don't think they're happy to see uh, these kinds of price increases and, and compensation packages being negotiated. So I think there is, I mean, this has been just the pattern of the market really for over a year that they keep expecting the Fed to go to at least neutral, if not soon start cutting rates. And I think that's going to continue to be disappointed until there's a crisis. Now, we had a bit of a mini crisis, you know, with the banks in, in the spring, and the Fed reacted by kind of going back to kind of a stealth QE. I mean, they injected a lot of money into the system to keep the banks solvent because uh, it really had the potential to, to go to go viral. The U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman has said the central bank will continue to raise interest rates, if appropriate, as inflation remains too high. Jerome Powell told an annual gathering of central bankers that the pace of price rises had fallen from a peak. However, it remains above the Fed's 2% target. David Hay, founder of Evergreen Gavacol, acknowledges that the Federal Reserve is likely displeased with the increased speculation in the financial markets and the rising prices and compensation packages. This pattern of expectation that the Fed would transition to a neutral stance or begin cutting rates has persisted for over a year. David anticipates that this trend of unmet expectations will continue unless a crisis emerges. Although inflation has moved down from its peak, a welcome development, it remains too high, Powell said in prepared remarks in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We are prepared to raise rates further if appropriate and intend to hold policy at a restrictive level until we are confident that inflation is moving sustainably down toward our objective. The renowned analyst asserts that the Fed is responding to the proliferation of speculation and elevated financial market prices by taking a different approach, potentially indicating a shift towards tightening monetary policy. Interest rate futures signal potential tightening by the Fed following Jerome Powell's moderately hawkish stance at the Jackson Hole Symposium. Regarding longer-term treasuries, Hay notes a significant change in the trend of interest rates on the 10-year Treasury yield. The decades-long downward trend in products has been shattered, and the 10-year Treasury yield has surpassed its previous resistance point, suggesting a bear market for longer-term Treasuries. We will now bring you clips from David Hayes' interviews with Soar Financially. But before we do, if you want more videos like this, make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell for more updates. Thank you, and enjoy the video. I guess the commentary coming out of Jackson Hole today is, is quite hawkish which I would expect. I, I think the Fed is not happy to see so much speculation in the financial markets. I don't think they're happy to see uh, these kinds of price increases and, and compensation packages being negotiated. So now they're going the other way. So this is one of the things that I think is greatly underappreciated by the, you know, the soft landing, no landing, trampoline landing crowd, which is that the, you're getting not only this the impact, this lagged impact of these almost unprecedented, at least since the early 80s, interest rate increases, but the Fed's back into a decided Q, QT mode, which means quantitative tightening, where they're actually selling treasuries rather than buying them with printed money. So the, the biggest, the bond market's biggest buyer is now a seller. And then you were talking about this earlier, the issuance. So this has been one of my two mega fears of, of this year was that in the second half, we would have what I call the 4F scenario, federal fiscal funding fiasco. And where they just, they swamp the market because the deficit, to be running a deficit that, that, that they are right now, which looks like it's going to be you know, about $2 trillion for this year, that's just unprecedented outside of some kind of deep recession. Uh, it's just un, un, unprecedented with unemployment at 35 or 3.6%. So what it means is, and this has really shocked the market a few weeks ago for briefly, then of course it moves on, but they announced that they were going to raise $1.85 trillion in the second half of the year. And that did get people a little bit. Of, so it was the same time that uh, Fitch downgraded the U.S., so it was kind of lost in all that you know, attention on the downgrade, which I thought was the much less important issue. So you've got this explosion of supply, constricting demand, and also foreign central banks are not stepping up to buy treasuries. So the major ones are actually divesting treasuries and generally recycling that, recycling that into gold or other currencies and bonds. And then you got the banks, which you know they've got way too many treasuries. So how all this is going to get financed, I think, is a risk that is just tremendously underestimated. You know, there's the banks have their reserves on, you know, on the, you know, where they're getting the interest rate with the Fed, which they didn't used to get, and they're getting over 5%. Uh, then you've got the reverse repo thing. So it's somewhere around $5 trillion, and that's been drawn down to a fairly large degree to finance those treasuries. And it's kind of like, you know, just changing from 
you know, one front row chair to another front row chair because you're going from a 5% short-term yield to a 5%, maybe slightly higher short-term yield with a T-bill. I think where the real problem is, is supposedly, well, not supposedly, they try to stay at about a 20% T-bill max, the federal government, the treasury, when they finance, they don't want to be totally on the short end. So that part, that part's easy because there's just so much demand for it and it can come out of those reserve accounts so easily. I think where it's really challenging is the longer end of the treasury curve. And when you're looking at the tenure, and by the way, I mean, one of the most important charts in the world right now, and I, I could gladly send it to you uh, that you could post uh, for your readers to look at is the 30 year trend in interest rates on the 10 year treasury yield. So we have clearly shattered that 30 year downtrend in yields and really even 40 year downtrend in yields. And we've broken above the three year resistance point. So we've made a new high this week, higher than we were last fall on the 10 year treasury yield. Very clear sign that we're in a bear market for longer term treasuries. Now, this is where it's tricky because this would be normally the time where I would say this you should be extending duration into 10 year or even longer treasuries. And I think there are trading opportunities there. I think you have to be very dexterous to take advantage of that. But the problem is that the, we've never had the situation where there's so much supply happening even before there's a recession. Imagine what that federal deficit is going to look like in the next recession. I mean, you could be talking 12% of, of GDP. Which, so you just, you know, where do the buyers come from in that kind of a situation? Does it force the Fed to come back in and be the buyer of last resort, maybe even the buyer of first resort? David Hay believes that the central banks, not just the Federal Reserve, but also numerous Western central banks, including the Bank of Japan, deserve significant blame for the misallocation of capital and recurring speculative bubbles. He points out that they played a role in causing these issues. To protect oneself from this predicament, David suggests a more prudent approach would involve a mix of short-term treasuries that offer around 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 yield combined with investments in emerging market debt. Regarding commodity prices, the renowned analyst emphasizes that although there was a belief that inflation might recede due to a temporary drop in commodity prices, these prices are now beginning to rise again. Let's get back to the interview. So I think clearly the central banks, uh, not just the Fed, but a lot of the Western central banks, and, and I throw the Bank of Japan in there, deserve a lot of blame for that type of misallocation of capital and you know repetitive speculative manias. So it's that's who blew it. How you protect yourself is so that's you know right now that's the the dilemma. You know, is the question the question is is it is it time to go long long bonds? And as I said earlier, normally I'd say yes, this is the perfect time to do it. But I don't think so. I think that it's better. I mean, again, some trading rallies, absolutely. And some people say, look, there's a huge short position on the long treasuries. But it looks like that's probably due to the hedging of uh, a very long duration you know, cash portfolios. So I'll put that under kind of the I don't know category. That's kind of confusing. But I think what's a safer play is to use a barbell of those short treasuries that pay five, five and a half and emerging market debt. I think emerging market debt with funds that and there are a number of closed end funds in America that, that, that do target the stronger uh, economies and bond markets. And you've got countries like Brazil, where they reacted much quicker to the inflation spike. They got interest rates up to 14 percent. Inflation's back down to four or five percent. Now they can cut rates. They can cut rates a lot. The currency's going up. And there's a host of emerging market countries that look like that. So I think that's a much better way to play the longer end of the yield curve. So uh, that's I think that's one a logical way to do it. I think commodity prices, you know, they got crushed. That's that's why I kind of thought inflation would come down cyclically. But now these commodity prices are starting to go back up and led by oil. And of course, oil filters through the economy in so many ways. Uh, now it has run lately, so I'd be a little careful about it. We put out a table pounder buy in our newsletter on energy back in in mid June, and we fortunately got pretty lucky, caught it pretty much at the at the trough. So, uh, you know, we've, we believe that energy's got a, a major tailwind to it. We've loved uranium, but uranium has really run here lately. Uh, if you bought any uranium, uh, I would just nibble on it. But uh, I just think the nuclear renaissance is, is coming. I, I kind of scratch my head about your country, and they seem to want to, to close down nuclear reactors. But there's 60 nuclear reactors under construction around the world, not, not a single one in America, unfortunately. But I do think America is going to go with small modular reactors, which I'm a big fan of. So just bottom line, I, I think investors should be focused on nuclear. I think it is going to be a, a really 
uh, a long lived revival. I think he can make a lot of money over a 10 year period by playing, you know, the most attractive nuclear uh, vehicles. Unfortunately, the miners themselves are a little tricky because they're uh, like Cameco, which is the premier is, is had an explosive move. We had that did really well, sold it too early, but if that one gets hit hard and it I actually did put out a little bit of a buy notice on that one, uh, I think it was last spring, whenever it dipped down to the low twenties, but uh, just in, in general, I think commodities are going to be a trial. Lithium would be an area I'd look at right now because we had one of our lithium stocks that went straight up earlier this year. It's come down hard, and uh, I think it will run again. Lithium is going to be in, in short supply, as are most of these essential components or inputs for the great green energy transition. You know, lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper. Copper looks quite attractive long term. The major U.S. copper producers had a major as a significant pullback correction. So there's definitely places to be. Gold, I think the gold miners are pretty intriguing. One of the blue chip ones yield 4%. New one. Right. Yeah, and that was, so I'm actually writing this up for my newsletter for tomorrow, if I can get it done, <laughs> is that, uh, you, you know, people say, well, don't buy gold because it doesn't pay anything. Well, if you can get a 4% yield versus, say, a 4% treasury or 425 today, I guess it is, but you know, essentially the same yield, and you've got something that's scarce. I mean, the Fed, though is widely expected to hold rates steady at a range of 5.25% to 5.50% at the September 19th, 20 meeting. The economy is running faster than the Fed expected it would, along with the labor market, but inflation is cooling and is expected to do so. The Fed's stance that it is higher for longer remains intact. What are your thoughts on the Federal Reserve's approach to interest rates and the current state of the financial markets? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below. If you found this video informative, remember to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and enable notifications to stay informed about our latest videos on silver, gold, and copper. Thank you for watching, and we appreciate your support.